Have you seen the boys? You gotta watch this funny TV show. Oops, I'm not muted. I think it's letting them add as they pop up. Close this. Low hello to you too. Can everyone hear me? Thumbs up if you can hear me. Sweet. Mm -hmm. This is strange. For some reason, I can't see. It's not right. It's the right mic. Can you all see me on the big screen or my little box? Big screen? Awesome. So I'm wearing a mask, um, but I have to take it off because I'm six feet away from somebody and I have a little bit of a cough. So I'm gonna do the right thing. You just keep your space, dude. But if you watch the video on microbes, you don't wear masks just because of you, you wear masks because of other people. So I have a cough and I wanna make sure that people around me are protected too. Welcome back, I already recognized a couple of you, so that's awesome. Um, I can't remember why I recognize you, if it was from the in-class STEAM things that we did or if it's because you did the shark dissection with us too. But either way, hopefully you got the shark dissection, it was fun, real fun. So if you haven't met me before, I'm Shannon Egley. I am the anatomical coordinator at JUMP, and this is my lab. So anatomical coordinator, what it does is uh, sets up the labs for practice surgeries. We do a lot of simulation at JUMP. That's pretty much what we do, JUMP simulation. Uh, we set up simulated environments for medical training, whether you're a doctor or a nurse or an EMT or working in a life flight helicopter. We even do things for engineers that want to build things for medicine. So Part of the, the STEAM programs, we want you to keep an open mind about medicine. You don't have to be a doctor if you go into medicine. You can be a lot of other things. You can build things like engineers do for medicine, or you can be you know, any part of the medical team. From the time someone's in an emergency scene, uh, being a paramedic, to the nurses and doctors that take care of them from the time they're in the hospital until they leave. So there are a lot of things you can do. What we're doing today, oh, sorry, anatomical coordinator here. This is the lab, and then I'm also uh, clinical Associate of Anatomy, so I teach anatomy to med students at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. So it's kind of fun, I get to meet the med students before they're doctors, I get to teach them anatomy, and then once they become a doctor, a lot of them come over to the lab here and they practice, so they get really good at surgeries, so they don't make mistakes. Whether they're doing heart surgery or they're doing brain surgery, they can come here and practice and practice, so that when they work on you, they're really good at it, and they don't make a mistake on you. Um, what we're doing today is compar comparative anatomy of sea creatures. And I actually got asked this question last night, why are you teaching something about sea creatures? You're not a veterinarian and they're right. I'm not a veterinarian. Um, my background, I'm a neurophysiologist. So I'm a scientist that enjoys the brain and all the parts of the brains, spinal cord and nervous system and how it works with all the body in humans. But I also did a lot of research with animals when I was in college and uh, we're doing comparative anatomy so I can tell you the things about the human or what's happening in you at the same time we talk about the different sea animals. Because we're all alive, uh, whether you're a sea creature or animal, or you're a human animal, or a horse, or a pig, or whatever type of animal. So we have a lot of things in common, and we'll try and point those things out. Alrighty, you should have a kit. We only have a couple hours, so I wanna dig right in. It looks like that, and that. So here are your um, patients. Oops, 
And here's your kit of dissecting tools. So the first thing we want to do is we'll go through the dissecting tool kit, make sure that you have everything. And then we'll try and get right into getting our hands gross. And that's like the best part. So go ahead and grab your kit. I'm going to flip on a second screen. Hopefully it'll show all the dissecting tools better. Oh, that's how it did. I'm thinking out loud, sorry. You do that a lot. If you don't talk to yourself, you're missing out on a lot of good conversations. Right? Nobody knows you better than you. Okay, you don't have this placemat, but this placemat's here to help me remember where the center of my screen is. It also helps me remember why we're here, because OSF and University of Illinois College of Medicine kind of had a simulation baby and that's jump simulation. So we work with both of them. It's a collaboration between these two companies. OSF that actually practices the healthcare and University of Illinois College of Medicine that teaches those healthcare practitioners and jump helps train for both. PNC is also donating a lot to um, help us get the kits out to you so we can keep them inexpensive and you can have a lot of fun with it. So we put their logo on there. Let's spill the kit. So hopefully you can also see me like up on the side or across the top or something in addition to the dissection set. Move my chat box and you should have an option for a chat box either down here or up at the top if you want to pop that open. If you have a question, um, you're muted, but maybe a parent or someone with clean hands can type the question in and I'll keep my eyes open to see if I catch it right away. In fact, I'll move it right. There, so they can see it a little bit better. All right, the kit. So again, the plastic bag should have a foam board. And at the top of the foam board, you should have six steel pens. When you're using these, I'm kind of a nut about taking care of sharps. They're very sharp at the tip. They're not gonna hurt you. When you poke it into something, you're not gonna get an infection or catch any kind of disease from it. But it hurts and it can irritate your skin and those chemicals get under your skin. So the best thing to do is while you're working with them, you can put it down like this, but when we're all done with it, make sure you put them back into the top so that no matter how hard you push, it doesn't poke out. That way you don't cut yourself or stab yourself. So you should have six stick pens. We'll use those. You should have a ruler. My focus is going crazy, so hopefully it doesn't go too crazy the whole time. You should have a booklet. Oops, not that one. <laughs> you should have that one, which is a really good point. You should have one that says comparative anatomy of mysterious sea monsters just in time for Halloween. You should have PPE, your personal protective equipment. So things like glasses and apron. Two gloves, unless you have three hands, let us know. We'd send you three gloves. And those are your protective pieces. Your other dissecting tools would be a pair of pickups or tweezers or forceps, depending on how technically you want the term. This is a probe. It's sharp and pointy at one end, flat and sharp at the other. I like to keep it stuck in the pad so I don't poke myself. You have a pen and a pair of scissors. And I know they look like kindergarten scissors, but they're actually really useful for dissection and they have a nice ruler on the tip of them too. When you're done, you can keep them if your parents are okay with it or just throw them in with the rest of the set. And then you have a bookmark that has a link to some apps that we have. So you can download like a coloring book. And it's really fun to play with because you can color a heart or a brain, put your tablet with the app on it or your phone with the app on it over your picture and it pops out in 3D at you. Pretty sweet. But there are a lot of other games and also a bunch of videos for um, like different systems of the body and how they work. So you should have all those pieces. And then the last thing is the bag. And the bag is actually going to be one of the first things we use. So uh, let's put our gloves on. I said first thing we use, but in reality, no matter what you do, when you walk into a lab, the first thing you should do is put your personal protective equipment on or PPE. 
you have small gloves. I prefer small gloves, even though I have bigger hands because I can pull them tight on my fingers and it lets me feel things. I can feel all the bumps, the grooves, the squishiness. Um, if I'm working with a shark, I can feel the scales on the shark. It's really sweet. The lamprey, I can feel its teeth. Just don't push too hard on the teeth. You can feel the barnacles or other things on the crab. You definitely want to use all your sensations except taste. Please don't use taste. But when we open it, you'll probably smell things like fishiness. Maybe remind you of sushi or just stinky fish. I don't know. Um, use your feel. Use your sight. Describe the colors. Um, be open-minded. Try and explore with your mind and see what you can see, even outside of what I tell you. An adult apron, you have that. So just open it up. I have a lab coat on. But when you open this up, you'll find strings that'll go around your head. You'll find one that'll go around your waist that's tucked in there. And I'll give you a minute to put those on. You want to tie it. You'll want to make sure that it's covering all of the front of you. The chemicals that are with the, the fish aren't going to hurt you, but if they get on clothes, they can stain the clothes and they can make them stinky. So you just want to try and keep all of the splash and everything inside the, thank you, inside the bag. Are you wearing scrubs? Are you wearing green scrubs? That's awesome. My daughter actually has a lab coat. Um, her picture's on the website. She has a lab coat and she stuck her finger in the shark's mouth and she's going, ah, it's funny. And when she became a big sister, we got her special scrubs that said big sister on them so that she could go in the hospital. Back in the good old days when family could go into the hospital. All right, and then you wanna put your goggles on. These goggles are meant for your size. Mine, I'm actually gonna wear glasses. If you're wearing glasses, it's fine to keep your glasses on as long as they touch your cheek so that nothing splashes up and gets in your eye. If you have smaller glasses that don't, you can put the goggles on right over the top of them. My glasses. Thank you. Oh, are these crooked ones? They always make me look like I'm surprised when I put the wrong ones on. Okay, so all of this stuff, we're gonna slide to the side, off of your table. I'm just gonna put it behind me. I can't pick it up. Okay, and you can see me. Here's the big black bag. Don't open it like a trash bag. You want to find the end that has the cut or perforation and a seam. So I think you can see uh, this side has the perforation where it ripped, but there's also a little seam that goes along it, where this one does not have that. That just has the rip, but no seam. So this is the part that would normally be open. You don't want that side. You want this side that has the extra seam, the bottom of the bag. All right, we're gonna open it up. We're not gonna open it like a garbage bag. We're just gonna open it flat like a bed sheet or a tablecloth, and that's what you're gonna use it as. So put it right in the center of your work area. So if you splash or splatter, it's a big sheet. It's about five feet long, about three and a half feet wide. So that's a pretty decent splash zone. And then take the work tool, right back in the middle of it. Fish. Great. Cool. And now I'm eager to get started. Oh, yeah. So, first page. If you have done one of these on demand ones before, you've seen this. First page says, Think like a scientist. Um, when I was going through high school and grade school, I never ever thought I would be a scientist. I always pictured scientists as being these geeky guys, like the way I look right now. They work in a lab and um, they never have any fun, but it's actually just the opposite. You've been a scientist since you were a little baby. It's just that scientists keep thinking like that for the rest of our life. So think about this. When you're a baby, you're trying to explore the word, world and understand the world. You see a yellow ball and you pick it up and you put it to your mouth. And you do that because your greatest sensation is actually in your fingertips and your lips. So they put it to their mouth so they can understand the feel of the ball. They taste the ball, they can smell the ball, they can see the color of the ball. Babies see, see things best up close. So 
they're using all their sensations. Maybe they squeeze the ball to hear if it makes a sound. And they do that when they see a purple ball or a red ball or whatever. What they're doing is they're observing, they're seeing things in their environment. They're questioning and saying, what's this feel like? What's it smell like? What's it taste like? Uh, after they've tried a few of them, they create a hypothesis and they say, well, I bet this, this purple ball tastes like the red one. So they feel it and they go, oh yeah, a ball is a ball is a ball. But then we experiment. So babies experiment with other things that are yellow and round, like maybe they grab a lemon and they pull that to their mouth and they can smell it as they're coming close and they stick it in their mouth and they grimace, right? Sometimes that stops the baby, other babies keep going back for more. They experimented with it. And the next time they see anything that's yellow and round, they're going to be hesitant. They're going to wonder, is this a ball or is it a lemon? And then they start learning because they keep experimenting over and over again. Yellow things, hmm. If they're bumpy, probably a lemon. If they're smooth, they're probably a ball. But they collect this information. They analyze it in their head. They don't report data to anybody. Usually they can't speak. But in their mind, they understand what happens when they grab a yellow lemon or if they grab a yellow ball or if they grab things that are like a lemon, like an orange or a grapefruit. They start understanding these different things and they modify that experiment and repeat with an orange or with a grapefruit and they want to know their world. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times we grow out of that questioning the world and we just do what we're told, which is also good, but it's also good to understand why you're doing what you're told to do. So sometimes it's important to ask the, you know, the teacher, why is it we do this this way or why is it we do that that way? And growing up, I always thought, well, this is the way it's always been done. So that's the way it's always going to be done. But in the last couple of years, even in education, they've redesigned the way that we teach kids math or reading and things like that because we found there are better ways. Maybe you're the person that'll find that better way someday. So hopefully when you're experimenting with these things, you ask a lot of questions. And when we're done with this, hopefully you don't stop when we're done, put it all in the trash and be done with it. Feel free as long as your parents are okay with it to experiment, cut other pieces off. If you want to look into the tentacle and see what's in the tentacle of the squid, cut it in half and look into it and see if there's something inside. Is it muscle? Is there a tube in there? Um, is there, how does that suction work? Maybe you can figure that out. If you want to cut the crab leg off and look at the tendons in the leg, those are things we're not going to have time to do, but you are welcome to explore and figure it all out. And if you're curious, I don't know if you figured this out, but Google seems to know everything. So if there's a piece of the anatomy that we don't talk about and you're curious about it, like the tendons in the crab leg, just Google crab leg tendon or have somebody Google it for you and read about it. Be curious. And that's actually this part, have the right tools. And it's not the tools that we have on the table in front of us, it's actually the tool you have between your ears. So keep asking questions, keep experimenting, keep exploring. Um, I'm not trying to plug the other STEM things, but if you like doing the water creatures, definitely get the shark, explore with the shark. The videos, you can just get it and then watch the video and go through the whole dissection. You can compare the shark with the other sea creatures. Um, we're coming up with new ones. We're thinking about doing one with owls. So not dissecting an owl, but actually dissecting the things that owls eat, like crickets and scorpions and a mouse. And then at the very end, you'll dissect an owl pellet, which is whatever it ate. And you'll figure out based on the skeleton, which of those things it will be. Um, just keep your mind open, try different things. Look online and see if there are cool things you can learn from, from other people out there. All right, so have the right tool. An open mind is the best tool. Get prepared, basic safety science, put your PPE on, you already did that. Gloves, eye protection, lab coat. Make sure there's a sink nearby. Anytime you handle a sharp, put it into the pad. Don't leave it so that if you grab something. I've done this before and it's dumb, I hate it. Um, but I've left a pen sitting somewhere. I put a sample on top of it, like a, an organ. And I grab the organ and I actually stick my finger with the pen, not thinking about it. So always know where your pens are, anything sharp. And then always have an adult with an ear and eyesight. So ear shout and eyesight. So that if something does go wrong, you spill something, you can get their attention right away. We walk through the kit. There's an example of a kit all open up and all the tools you should have. Hopefully you opened the tool kit up and we're looking at everything ahead of time, but not the sea monsters, right? Now is the time for sea monsters. So what we're gonna do here, we're gonna open the specimens. You're gonna observe and compare in your head. Oh, I missed this red. Don't jump ahead, listen, watch, then do. So I will tell you what to do, then you're gonna do it and we're gonna talk about what you did. It's kind of how I like to do things. So, first thing you're doing, don't do this yet, I'm gonna walk you through it. There's a rubber band holding this, there should be two bags. There's an inner bag with your, your animals and there's an outer bag that's clear. The outer bag should be clean, there shouldn't be anything in it. We're gonna keep that at the very end, you're gonna put everything back into that bag and throw it away. Pull the rubber band off, I hang out of the rubber band too. And you can pull, 
outer bag out. If you don't have a leak, if you have a leak, go straight to the next step. Get a garbage can. And you can see there's juice on this end. I'm going to take the juicy end and my scissors. Take it. You can take this to a sink. When the formaldehyde and formalin, it's actually formalin now, which is not as toxic as formaldehyde used to be, but when it goes into the animals, it actually neutralizes it so it's not as toxic. This juice was inside the animal, so it's safe to put down a drain. You just let the water run for three to five minutes afterwards. So if it's okay with your parents, you can put it over a sink. I just like doing it in the trash. So I'll take the bottom corner where the juice is at, give it a little snip. And I let the juice drain out. Done. Now I can take that bag back to my table. So now you can do the same thing. So the first thing is you take your specimens out of the clear bag, put the clean clear bag to the side, take the specimens to a trash or a sink, let the juice go to the corner, snip the corner so the juice pours out but all the animals don't come out, and then take it back to your table. I feel like I have to have some Jeopardy music or something mm -hmm. playing. Do, 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 do. I keep looking up. I have, if I'm looking this way, it's because I have all of you over here. My camera's right there. I should move it so bad. Yep, you can do it now. I didn't see that text, so hopefully. Wow, big mouth on it, I said. It's like, oh! <laughs> so on my way, I walk to work. So don't think I'm driving into this, but on my way to work, I was looking at my cell phone, watching River Monsters, and they were talking about lamprey. And this guy let a lamprey latch onto his neck just to show how it worked. And it was absolutely disgusting. And, ugh, the hair on my back is standing up. Yeah, goosebumps all over thinking about it. Okay. So now you have your bag. Just cut the top off the bag so that you can put the stuff back in if you need to. And set it down. We'll pull out what we need as we need. The first thing I actually want you to pull out is a sponge. So you should have a sponge. It might look like this one. It might look like this little one. It might look like this kind of brown one. But this was actually a last minute addition. When we talk about things like diversity and different types of animals, I thought we always think of things with legs or fins or um, you know, something that has a heart and can push blood, but these are actually animals. So we'll talk about this too. I don't want you to forget that we have these. So we're gonna talk about those. But a sponge was a living thing and you know, we use it as a sponge. It was funny, I was actually telling someone that I put the sponge in um, to the set because it's an animal and they're like, well, what was a sponge before it was a sponge? I said, it was a sponge. And they said, no, no, no. So I understand we bathed with sponges and we washed things with sponges, but what was it when it was alive? And I said, it was a sponge and it was alive. So it's a sponge. In fact, what makes that even worse is that they called these bath sponges. So the name for this is a bath sponge in the ocean. We pulled them out and we used them as bath sponges hundreds of years ago. So it's kind of fun. I love the little actually moments that you can mess with somebody's head like that. It's great. What was it? It was a sponge. No, what was it before it was a sponge? It was a sponge before it was a sponge. 
when it was alive, it was a sponge. Okay, so let's talk about those different samples. You should have five different things. You should have a squid, a starfish, which technically is called a sea star, and I still call it a starfish because why do you think we shouldn't call it a starfish? Did I stress that too much? It's not a fish. So it's not a fish, but we call it a starfish. It's actually a sea star. Um, and then a crab, you should also have a lamprey, which we don't have a picture here for, and sponge. So five samples to go through today. So you've opened your specimens. You can pull them out. We're going to observe and compare kind of in your head. Look for themes. That's the important thing. Not all of these have a head like we have. Some of them do. Like this is called a cephalopod. Cephala means head, cephalic, right? That's Latin for head. Pod means foot. So its head and its feet are actually connected. It's crazy. More out. Here's a lamprey. Looks like a snake. It is actually not a snake at all. It's a fish. And we'll talk about it. It's actually a weird fish because it doesn't fall into the two major classes of fish, but it's still a fish. So we'll talk about why it doesn't. You can see its mouth. You can see its fins like a fish has. It has a snake-like body. It doesn't have any limbs poking off like we saw with squid. Here's your sea star, starfish. I don't mind whatever you want to call it. A little extra seaweed that came with it. We don't need that. You might have one that feels a little bit more soft because the preservatives might be firm. But what kind of things do you think it has in common with this? I mean, you can't say they both have eight arms, right? Because this one has eight, this one has five. You can't say they feel the same, even though technically this has a shell. If we get a chance, we'll look at it. If not, that would be a great thing to Google. But this has a shell. This one doesn't technically have a skeleton. This one does, and it's not on the outside, it's on the inside. So some things we'll look for. They both have to eat though, right? There's a mouth, there's a mouth. Way in here, oh, there's the mouth. Wow, this one's actually kind of freaky. But you can see the mouth in the middle. On the crab, hopefully you got one with a lot of barnacles, which is kind of, I don't know if ironic is the word I would use, but that the barnacles are living creatures on top of the crab, which is a living creature. The barnacles are actually in the mollusca uh, phylum, just like the squid, but they live on type of, top of an arthropod, which is a crab, it's crazy. You can see the mouth on the crab hiding in there. There's the mouth in between. What about this guy? I mean, it has to be able to eat, so we're gonna have to figure out how it eats. But look for things they have in common. What things do they all share? What things do they have different? I mean, obviously you can pick out, they all look very different, so you can pick out characteristics that are different. But what kind of things do they have in common? When we're describing things on the, the, uh, the specimens, we wanna use anatomical terminology terminology and there are really two types of medicine. There's Eastern medicine that's based from China um, and there's Western medicine that's based out of Europe and we are Western medicine. So when we use anatomical terms, all of Western medicine, you know, the medicine you probably really know unless you've heard of acupuncture or Chinese herbs and stuff is based off of this. So it's a special language that Western medicine decided a long, long time ago that when we name things, we're going to use a basic language that's common across all of the Western Hemisphere, or part of the world. And we're gonna use Latin and Greek because they're two of the oldest languages. In fact, a lot of our languages that we use are based off of Latin and Greek, like Spanish and French. So they came up with a medical terminology that all doctors can use. These are important to know because when you're talking about terms or directions, I use these to describe directions the way that you use North, South, East, and West to describe directions. So where you might use the word front of a fish, we use ventral. Where you would say the back of the fish, we use dorsal. So when we describe something like this fin on the back of this fish, what term will we use to describe that? Will we say it's the ventral fin or the dorsal fin? Okay. I always think ventral is the side that we ventilate from. So we breathe and eat through our mouth, right? 
nose, breathing. But on the, we ventilate from the front side. Dorsal, I always think of a shark, right? When a shark comes up close to the water, you see their fin that comes up, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, like that. That's their dorsal fin. So this we call a dorsal fin. When I, even when I teach med students, the anatomy, they're like, oh, there's so many words, there's so much anatomy. But really when you learn some of these basic words, you can make up the rest of the things. Describe parts of your abdomen, the muscles in your abdomen. We usually call them the external abdominal muscles, which means towards the outside, or the internal abdominal muscle, which means the ones in the, the inside. And those are the real names. So we don't get fan, real fancy with it. But dorsal means the back. So when I use that, I mean the back. Ventral means the front. Cranial means cranium, like your head, your skull is called your cranium, is towards the head. Caudal means tail, so it's towards the tail. Those are four really, really common terms. Sometimes I say lateral, which means to the side of the animal. Sometimes I say medial, which is towards the median or middle point. When I say something is proximal, it's in close proximity, so it's close to whatever I'm describing. If I say it's distal, it means it's distant. Um, if I say it's superficial, your skin is very superficial compared to your muscles, which are deep in your body. So some of these kind of hopefully make some sense, but they're not terms you use every day. So when we label these different things, we'll label them based on where they're at, right? So again, we're gonna compare the species, we'll compare some of the terms, we'll use relative directional terms, and we're gonna try and find the things that they have in common and what they have different. So next one, what is life? So this is kind of like the you always have to learn something important rule where someone's got to um, teach you something, right? Instead of just having fun, this is the part you're learning something. So when we talk about life, we're talking about things that are living. And there are certain things that all living creatures have in common. It doesn't matter if you're a worm or a bacteria or a fish. It just doesn't matter. So all living things have to carry out metabolism, which means that they have to get energy from their environment and do something with that energy. So like getting sugar or getting proteins or whatever. And then we turn those sugars and proteins into something more important in our body. To do that, we have to have a form of movement. We have to, way to have a way to get the food. We have to have a way to digest the food. We have to be able to breathe because just like a fire, when it's burning something, it needs oxygen. Your body to burn sugars and burn fuels, it needs oxygen too. A car is the same way. To burn gas in a car, it has to get oxygen. And then circulate. You have to have a way to move things around the system. So this is one of the important things about life. And here's one of your actually moments. When we talk about COVID or the coronavirus, a virus is not alive because a virus can't move on its own. When you sneeze or cough, you propel the virus. It doesn't move on its own. You are pushing it out. It doesn't eat. It doesn't digest, it doesn't breathe, and it doesn't circulate anything. What a virus does is it gets into a living thing, like a squid or a human or a cat or a dog, and then it takes over the living thing's cells. That's what a virus does. So a virus is technically not alive. It's not a living organism. So when you see trees of life broken down like this, even the biggest tree that covers everything alive in the entire world, millions of different species, a virus is never on one of these trees. Cells are like these, but never a virus because it's not alive. And I'm always looking for actually moments that you can, when someone says, oh yeah, a virus is alive, you can say, well, actually, it's not. So, and you can explain why. It's not alive because it can't replicate on its own. It can't digest food on its own. It can't move on its own. It has to depend on a cell from a human or another animal, right? And then I kind of said this ahead of time, but other than metabolism, it has to be able to replicate. So it needs to make copies of itself. So one mouse doesn't just make another mouse. It takes two mice to make a third mouse, right? Or the same with cats, foxes, dogs, et cetera. Sometimes you get some weird situations like a liger. Take a guess at what those two animals were. And it's a real thing if you didn't know that. So a liger is a special type of species because it can't have offspring. It can't have babies. So a tiger and a lion made the liger by having a baby liger but that baby liger can't make offspring from it. Same with a mule, if you didn't know this. A horse and a make a mule baby, but a mule can't have babies. So they're a special type of species because they can't reproduce, they can't replicate from that point. So we have special categories for them. But there's so much diversity. I just mentioned there are over a million different species that are living today, not fossil records and all that stuff. 
but it's hard to describe. I mean, how do we, how do we group things? A mouse and a rat? I used to do research with rats and a, rouse, a mouse and a rat still look the same to me. A small rat and a big mouse look the same. But there are third, certain ways that they eat their food, certain ways that they process their food, certain ways that they live that are actually different that make them different. So if you're a human being, it doesn't matter whether you're white, black, uh, Mexican, Asian, whatever, we're all exactly the same because we do all of these processes exactly the same, not like a mouse and a rat. So diversity just describes the differences between different species. We are all the same species, but um, mouse and rat, not the same species. So when they describe a species and they build the tree from them, there's something called the biological concept and the morphological. Biological is how they live, how they carry out these things. You can't really see a lot of these when you're describing that tree. So a lot of us prefer something that's morphological. Morpho means change in shape. So it's your shape change. So things like this, which of these would you characterize as being the closest in relation? Cat, fox, dog, or a bear? Which two do you think are the closest? I'm gonna hope you're thinking quickly and you go, oh, maybe. And I didn't mean to have the cat and the fox close together and the dog and the bear close together because actually the two closest in relationship are these two, the fox and the dog. So even though a cat and a fox have a lot of things in common, like they both have retractable claws, dogs don't have that, bears don't have that. But, but the fox, because of its metabolic process and a lot of the other things that it does, is actually really close related to a dog. In fact, if we described a dog, this is another weird thing, we can break it down from very vague, all the different living planet, we can break down into three domains, considered eukarya, because we have lots of cells, a dog are both in here. King animalia, that means everything is an animal. It's the squid, you, the dog, all of that. Phylum is where it starts getting. So what are groups have in common? This chord data means that they have a cord. A dog has a spinal cord, spinal cord. The giraffe has a spinal cord. A fish has a spinal cord. So in chordates or chordata. Then mammals, things that feed, um, things that usually are covered in hair, not in that group, but a giraffe, a dog, are, humans are, my zoom is going crazy. Helps, boom. And then we can keep breaking down from here. But when we get dogs, we keep going down, 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 down. Final branch, the species is called the canine. There's another animal that's in this, it's a wolf. And so what's really weird is that even though a wolf is in the same species, they're actually pretty different, but we classify them the same. So sometimes there are little branches coming off to explain, like this that we'll talk about later. So what we're gonna do, again, look for those features. We're gonna do this. The three domains just talked about, um, like plants, uh, eukaryotes, which were us, and then bacteria but we're gonna specifically look at the animal kingdom. So all the animals that make up the animal kingdom, like you and me and everything on this table. Here are the questions you're gonna ask. Does this animal have specific tissues? Does it have a heart? Does it have lungs? Does it have gills? Does it have whatever? That's specific. And we classify by they either have them or they don't. Does it have radial symmetry, which means symmetric? Sorry, is describing its shape. So if it's radial, does all of its limbs go out from one center point? Bilateral is like a mirror image. So is your left side and your right side, do you have a left and a right, they're mirror images? That's bilateral. A, anytime you see A at the beginning of a medical term, it means without. A, symmetrical, means there is no symmetry. Like it doesn't have a real shape. When it grows, it just grows kind of like a blob all over. So we can classify animals like that. This one we're gonna skip over because um, it's kind of weird, but does the animal's gut develop from front to back or back to front? So in other words, does it have um, does it develop its butt or its mouth first? And eh, it's a little too deep for us. Some animals are gonna see actually their bottom and their top are the same. So the mouth and their rear are the same whole. Uh, does growth occur by molting or by continually growing skeletal elements? So do they have to shed their skin, skeleton, or can they just keep growing and growing? Like you, what do you do? Do you molt and shed your skin as one big sheet and grow a new one? Or do you continuously grow? you continuously grow. 
animals that molt, I always think of uh, like every year the locust sheds shed their shell. That's molting. All right, first animal, the phylum, porifera. I love how the names are kind of hidden in here. It means it's a porous structure. Boom, it's a sponge. So in the picture, there are lots of different shapes of sponges. This one's called a leuconoid sponge because it doesn't have a center canal like this. Sponges, we don't think of as being a moving animal, but when they're a baby, they're actually um, mobile. So they have a little thing called a flagella that helps them swim, just like a bacteria, and they can swim around or like a tadpole. So they swim around, they plant themselves where they want to grow, and then they grow into something like this. What's really interesting is for reproduction, this is a boy and it's a girl. It's the same. So this sponge can actually replicate without being around any other sponges. In fact, it can break off a little piece of itself. It can float through the water and land somewhere and grow a whole new sponge that's exactly like the parent. So it's kind of a cool animal. And that's why I threw it in is because it defies all the other animal rules, but it's still an animal. In fact, before we started looking at DNA, we thought this was a plant, but um, we had to reclassify it as an animal. when We learned that it does everything an animal does just in its own weird ways. <clears throat> So movement, it does it. Digestion, if you were to look really close, if I can get zoomed in, look super close. I don't know how clear that comes out, but if we had a microscope, you could see these even closer. But you see all the little nets, the webbing? That's how it eats. So water flows through the sponge. It's like a filter. It catches bacteria and plankton. Um, blue crab babies are super tiny. They get caught in sponges and the sponge will digest all of those things and spread the digested stuff all around the sponge. It's not like you where you have a digestive tract and you can just eat, go to the stomach, go to your intestines, process all the food and then let go of it. A sponge, like, um, this is really weird, but it turns its food into ba basically baby food. It digests it into a soup and that soup spreads to all the other cells to eat. So it does have a digestive-like system but it doesn't have any organized tissues. It doesn't have a heart, it doesn't have a lung, it doesn't have a brain, it doesn't have any of that. It can tell when you touch it. It doesn't have a nervous system, but the cells talk to each other by a special pathway. So sponges are actually really kind of a cool creature. And again, that's why it threw them in. How would you describe its symmetry? Would you say it's radial and it has legs that poke out in all directions? Would you say that its left side looks like a mirror image of its right? I don't even know which side's left or right on this guy. I do know that's where they cut it off the sea, so it was planted down like this. Or would you say it's asymmetrical without a real organization? This is totally asymmetrical. It just grows wherever. Sponges can move things. I just mentioned that with digestion, it can push that soup around. There's a cool YouTube video. Uh, I think it's just sponge dye movement, like D-Y-E, like colored dye, and a guy, goes underwater with a, a cup of yellow like food coloring, dumps it next to the sponge, and you wait, and you wait, and next thing you know, the sponge is squirting it out the top. It sucks the dye into the side and pushes it out. So it's kind of a cool video to watch if you get a chance to Google it. But that's what they do. They push things around. Whether they have a central core, or like this one, the leuconoid is just, it's all pathways, like a maze all through this. What I thought was interesting is this is not a picture of a sponge. This is a picture of a human lung. So with human lungs, here are the air pathways called bronchioles. The air comes in, air goes down into these little tiny areas called alveoli, the little sacs. A sponge is built the same way. It has pathways that go in for water, and then it has outlets all over the place where it pushes it out into these little sacs that filter. So I thought that was pretty cool because this is the same design as your, your lung. And nature took care of that. Um, when we look at the anatomy, there are really two layers of a sponge. There's a superficial or surface layer, and there's one right below it. They're not tissues, which is really weird. These cells that make these up, they have different shapes. Like some have flagella, some don't. They call this a collar cell because it has a long flagella and it has a bunch of short ones, so it can move the water down through the pathways. Um, the cells that sit along the surface, if it needs to grow a different cell, that cell can turn into a different one. So if it needs a cell that digests, one of the surface cells, like a skin-like cell, can actually turn into a digestive cell. One of the benefits of sponges in science is that we're actually trying to manipulate how it changes cells to help us fix tissue repair. So if somebody has a really bad burn or 
um, something happened to their skin and we have to put a skin graft, a piece of skin over it. We're trying to find out how we can use sponge cells to change and help grow that tissue into place properly. So another cool thing about medicine and understanding other animals is that you know, sometimes you can learn from those other animals how to fix us. Like plants, did anybody know that your blood has something called hemoglobin in it that carries oxygen? It makes your cells red. Certain types of wheat actually have hemoglobin, the same stuff that humans have in our blood inside of them. Did you know that? Fun fact. I met a guy that was doing research on it. I was like, wow, I didn't know that. So next animal. Not a lot to look at, but a really cool animal. Put the sponge to the side. And they can be different shapes, as you can see. They don't have to be that perfect little spongy round sponge. Here's another one. This one has kind of a central core. All right, next. Sea star, starfish. I'm probably always call it a starfish because that's how I was raised. I remember going to Florida when I was a kid and picking up starfish. I always kept one through the rest of them out in the ocean. Kind of liked watching them skip the water. It didn't hurt them. They've got a hard surface, but then they're out there doing their thing again, cleaning up the bottom of the ocean, which is actually their ecological benefit is that they're bottom feeders. They crawl along the bottom of the ocean and they eat dead fish, they eat clams, they eat, uh, well actually eat barnacles. They'll help clean other, um, well, like a crab. They could actually get a hold of the surface of the crab and clean the barnacles off of it. Or unfortunately for the crab, they could eat the crab. But starfish are kind of cool. And we think of them kind of as an inanimate just because of their shape, but they're very mobile. Again. YouTube or Google it and watch them move. It's cool how they can take their feet, their little suction feet, and grab a hold of glass or rocks or whatever and climb up it. Um, you'll want to watch it at like double speed or high speed because it's boring to watch them move slowly, but it's amazing watching them move. Right. So if we look at it, they have a spiny skin. This is the phylum Echinodermata. Echino means spiny up here. Derma means skin. So if you go to a dermatologist, you go to a skin doctor. So their skin's spiny. They don't have eyes, but they have little spots, the tips of each of these spines that detect light and darkness. So if you're going over them, they know when it's light or when it's dark. They can't see you in color or detailed shapes or anything, but they have a really simple nervous system. No brain, but they have a connection of nerves that go through that let the other arms know what's going on. Kind of like a jellyfish. A jellyfish doesn't have a brain, but it has a neural net where all the nerves can talk to each other. Uh, it has an internal skeleton. You'd think that this were the skeleton, but it's not, that's its skin. It actually has a skeleton on the inside and we'll work through there. It has five body parts. So what would you say about its body plan? Would you say it's asymmetrical, like a sponge without a shape? Would you say it's bilateral where it has a very clear left side and the right side? It looks like mirror images. Or would you say that it's radial where all of its limbs radiate from one central area, radial. So this is called the central disc. When it's growing, it starts as a central disc and actually grows all five of its arms out from that disc. If you cut off an arm, it can regrow that arm from the central disc, which is kind of cool. It has a water vascular system. We'll look inside. So when we cut this open, we'll see tubing that goes through. And it uses that tubing to actually uh, apply suction and move. Some plants can do that too, which is really cool. And then two feet, like I just said, for suction and grip. So how do they eat? What would they do? If we look at the mouth, the mouth. You can kind of pull back and look inside of it. That little dot right in the middle is the anus. That's where its poo comes out. So its mouth and its rear are actually the same place. One of the fun things about when we cut this apart is that we'll cut one branch off, but then you have four to play with later. So you can share, share the fun. So let's look inside. What we're going to do is we're going to slice one arm off just like this. You can see they cut a plane. We're going to slice it like that. So you can pick the arm. All these other arms look great. This one's kind of a little wonky. So I'm going to take this arm and cut it off. But I'm not, I'm going to cut right around the center. I'm not going to cut really close to the center of the starfish, I mean the center of the arms where I'm cutting, not close to the tip. So you can see all the little tube feet coming up here. And I'm just gonna snip, snip. 
I'm going to put this in some dirt and see if I can regrow a starfish. I'm kidding. It doesn't work that way. I'm going to open it up like this. And then you can see that design is kind of like this. It's not as perfect because this is exaggerated to show you the structures, but that's what we have probes for. So you can see there are four tubes. There's a little passageway right along here, and then a little water tube. So if I separate, there's one, two, three, four. Here's a little bit darker red tube. Open that up and I can see it. Here's a little darker red tube. Open that up and I can see it. Each of these are actually gonads, so the reproductive structures. The lighter colored ones right above it. See one right there, see one right here. This is actually the digestive tract. So there's a tube. It goes all the way down. Oops, that's the wrong picture. Here it is. Tube goes all the way down. And it's called a pyloric tube or digestive tube. Because what will happen is when it eats, it'll pull the food to the center of the mouth and then it'll push the nutrients down these tubes to feed all the arms. Okay. So how it eats, it'll come along, it finds a clam. Not even good to represent a clam, my fist. So, and there's the mouth of the clam. Hello. So it comes along, grabs a hold of the clam. Clam's in trouble because it can't move very fast. The starfish grabs a hold of it, takes this arm that I just cut off, sticks it right there at the opening and starts prying it apart. And all it has to do is open the clam. If you ever tried to open a clam or a mussel, they're hard to do. So it has to open it just a little bit. And as soon as it's open, the mouth is right there. This is the grossest part. We're gonna cut in here in a second, but you have two stomachs. The first stomach we see will actually come out of the starfish. Its stomach comes out of its mouth. It goes into the clam and then it digests the clam inside of its own shell. So it turns the clam into soup in its own shell. The shell weakens, pops open, and then it'll suck the soup back into the other stomach. Pretty gross, but kind of cool. So it actually does most of the digesting outside of the starfish. It does it in its victim. So then the shell is empty and it sucked all the clam soup and maybe it's clam chowder, I don't know. So it pulls it into the stomach, digests it, and pushes it down those pyloric pathways to feed the rest of the starfish. Pretty sweet. All right. Let's actually open this up a little bit more. So there's a radial path coming straight down. Called the amulolacral ridge. Amulo means motion. Lacral means tears, so a movement of water. And you see those little feet that can move, the tube feet? I'm going to cut right along the tube feet, right to the center. Oops. Boop. Now I can open it up. Open. Ooh, ouch, it bit me. I love that they color coded it for us. See the darker red and the lighter tan. There we go. So there's the gonad pathway. And there was the pyloric pathway, the digestive pathway right there. You can see the tube feet right along the edge. And if we look down in here, in the center, it's kind of hard to dissect it carefully like that, but it was kind of like a tomato. It's not a tomato. So here is actually one stomach. Here's the other stomach. We'll see if we can cut off just a little bit and expose that. So I'm going to cut one of the other arms right here, like here. It's kind of crunchy. And you have tweezers that you can use too. I'll wash two feet off. Cut here. I'm kind of cutting in a circle where the arms come together. Good. 
There we go. See how much I can get out. It's kind of tough. When they put the preservative in, it almost acts like a glue that holds a lot of things in place. So it makes it tough. My fingers are still working better, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, you can kind of see the pattern. See the roundness right there of the stomach? And again, that little spot right in the center, the anus. I ripped it a little bit, but you can see the edge coming around and there's a circle. And they don't have a brain again, but they do have a neural pathway. So at the, at the tube feet, these are called ampullae, and they can send signals back. So if you touch a starfish, it knows you're touching it. When it grabs a hold of something, it knows it grabs a hold of it. But it doesn't have a central brain like we see in a lot of other animals. You're welcome to explore, peel it apart, and actually look if there's the skeleton. So it has an endoskeleton within. This is the skin, it's not an exoskeleton. Even though it feels like it's armor, like a, like a bug has an exoskeleton. Lots of grossness on my book. All right. Next, Squidworth. So originally we were going to uh, joke about Bikini Bottom and SpongeBob. So I had the sponge and the squid and the starfish, Patrick and all that. And we decided not to. So you just have to imagine there's Squidward. SpongeBob. All right. When we look at it, it's phylum. Whoops, sorry, look shifted. As mollusca, I think of mollusks, things that usually have a shell, like a clam, a mussel, a barnacle. This could have a shell. All of those things that have the shell actually grow from something called the mantle. And this is the mantle this big tube-like structure through here. It's a mantle. You can squeeze it, it's kind of hard. You can stick your finger in it. Right. Feel back here, you can feel around. I can't get my finger in here because there's a cartilage that holds it together. So this is its back or its dorsal side. Here's its ventral side or the front side. The front side is the side I can put my finger all the way into. The dorsal or back side, I can't. So here's this little tip, it's called a pen tip. This little tube here tells me I'm on the ventral side or the front too. I can get it right there. It's called a siphon. At first, a lot of people think it's a mouth because if you look, there are the eyeballs, there's the face, face, and it almost looks like that's a mouth talking. Hey, how you doing? But it doesn't. It's actually a tube. So if you take your probe and wiggle it, actually, Let's not do the probe. Let's do the scissors. Take the scissors and wiggle, uh, wiggle it in. Close scissors. You'll see it comes all the way back in here. It's just a tube. So when the squid is moving fast, and they can move really fast, 25 miles an hour, phew, it's gone, right? The way that it moves that, like that isn't because of all these arms down here or tentacles. It does it because it'll fill this mantle with water. It'll squeeze the bottom part here and then squeeze really hard and it pushes the water down, not out here because it squeezed that shut, but into the siphon and out here like a jet propelling. <sighs> so if you see like military jets and they have that round where the rocket flames come out or whatever, that's what the siphon does. It's where the water squishes out really quick to push the squid through the, the sea, the ocean. All right, has squids look like an octopus because they're both called cephalopods. So that's the type of, um, animal that they are. They're, a, they're in the mollusca family, but their subgroup is actually called cephalopod. Cephala means head, pod means feet. Here's the head, and there are the feet coming off of it, cephalopod. So that's where those terms come back to play again. We already talked a little bit about movement. It can crawl or walk with these arms. These are called arms, not tentacles. It can grab a hold with tentacles. These are the tentacles. And can you see the difference? So if you look at an arm, 
See how the suction tubes go all the way down the arm, the tip, all the way down. Tentacles, no suction tube. Oops, got a couple there. But really no suction tubes until you get all the way to the end. And they use these kind of like hands where they'll grab a hold of things and they're really strong so they can pull or pry things apart. Like they can use them to pry apart a fish, rip a fish apart. So it's hard to get the fish all the way up into their mouth. So they have to kill the fish and then start eating off of it. Uh, and ecological benefit, they also eat things off the bottom of the ocean. They take other fish that we don't need in the ocean, like predatory fish, and they'll eat it because octopus and squid are super smart. They actually have a really well-developed brain. They can figure out how to get out of jars. Um, they call it prison breaking. You can put an octopus, and I heard this story. Um, someone put an octopus on an, an aquarium, uh, like a couple feet away from another aquarium that had a goldfish. They left, when they came back, the octopus was actually in the aquarium that had a goldfish, but the goldfish was gone. So that octopus figured out how to get up out of the aquarium, crawl over and get into the next one. If they find a, a goldfish in a jar, they can figure out how to unscrew a jar. Wow, monkeys don't even do that. So cephalopods are actually really smart and it's octopus, um, cuttlefish, or cuttlefish and uh, squid are the three main groups in that. All right, structures. So that was the mantle. And I started saying before, if this were to make a shell, it would actually make it in the mantle. You can feel when you squeeze, it's kind of firm on the dorsal side, the back side, because there is a cartilage shell inside of there that helps give it shape. But it's not like a muscle or a clam shell where it's hard, but they both come from the mantle. Okay. There are the eyes. This is something kind of cool. You take the eye, tweezers, grab the eye. There you can see nerve muscles that help control the eye's direction. I'm going to cut the eye out. Not for funsies, because that's weird. I'm going to do it because there's something in the eye I want. Oops. Uh-oh, I hope I didn't just lose it. So I'm just pushing underneath the eye, making sure nothing's attached. Reaching down in and clip, clip, clip. And you can explore later and see if you can find the brain. Oh no, did I look? Oh, oh, there it is. Okay, that's what I was looking for. This little hard pebble is the lens. So the lens, oops, there it is. It's dark, it's normally clear because it's like a magnifying glass that bends the light. So the squid can actually see really well, but it bends light for vision. When it's, when the squid's alive, it's squishy. It's like a magnifying glass that you can squish to focus. But once it dies and gets preserved, it's hard like a rock, but that's the lens. Okay, other anatomy. Just going down the list, arms. Here are the arms. How many arms did it have? The two tentacles. I'm sure you can guess if it's closely related to an octopus. One, two, oops, springy. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight arms. like an octopus. And then of course the two tentacles coming out. If you look at the mantle, see the coloring here? It's actually like that everywhere, but um, when it died, they probably put it down like this. And all the blood and everything pooled here and gave it that color. But all those little specks everywhere are actually called chromatophores. Chromo is referring to color. And these chromatophores can change colors, just like a chameleon, a squid and an octopus can change colors. In fact, they can change colors depending on their mood. So if they're angry, they can turn red really quick. If they're um, afraid, they can actually go a pale white across the surface. If they're on something that's a purple in color, they can change to hide. So they can change to camouflage, they can change to show their moods. Um, some people think that the cuttlefish changes because it's communicating like a language, so it changes colors quickly like it's almost sending a braille 
to other cuttlefish to talk, which is pretty amazing. All right, so chromatophores, tentacles we already talked about, the pen tip we already talked about, the siphon back here, the hole, the mantle was this entire body part, and then fin. Here are the fins. So the fins are exactly what you think they are. They're steering devices so that when it's swimming, I mean, it's basically a tube, these little guys on the back. If it didn't have a fin, it would just spin in circles through the water like a rocket out of control. But it can move this fin and glide, kind of like a stingray. You can use it to steer quickly. When they're out, it doesn't spin out of control. It's flat, like a plane flying in the water. Those are the fins. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, now it's time for internal anatomy. So I'm gonna feel in. That's the ventral side because I can get my finger all the way in. There's the siphon that reminds me it's the ventral side. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut straight up the mantle. Open it, put your scissors in, snip, snip. Oops. I usually like little bites. I went all the way on that one. Snip, snip, snip. Straight through. It'll get a little bit tougher to cut up here, and you don't want to stab or poke. One of the benefits to having a rounded tip like first grade kindergarten scissors is that you don't damage things like you would with straight scissors. So I can clear it up. Yeah. So this is very bouncy, chewy. I'm saying chewy because if you ever had calamari, that's calamari. They take this mantle, they pull all the guts out, and then they slice it into rings, deep fry it, throw it on your plate, and they charge you a bunch of money for it. If you didn't know that, there's your next fun fact. So it's springy like this, and we have to hold it open. We're gonna need our pen. When you put the pen in, Pull this out, put the pin in, but bend, and so the sharp tip goes back towards the squid and then and to the pad. That way, and in place, and it doesn't keep pulling out. Same with the other side. Pull it open, put the pin in at an angle going, oops, didn't hit the pad, going in towards the pad. Slide down a little bit, grab another pin. Put the pen in at an angle. Make sure it gets in the pad though. Angle. Pens. So I'll use all six of them. Hmm. I think I used one anywhere else. Oh, I'm gonna complain to jump. One pen. Oh, because now I can see all the internal organs. Yeah, acting crazy. I think it works. So let me move the book out of the way. Cover these words up. There we go. Cool. All right. Now we're at internal and. This up here are gonads, reproductive organs. It's a clear sheet called the pair. You have one too. It's a clear sac that wraps your um, neck and your intestines, et cetera, et cetera. You have one, they have one. We're gonna actually carefully cut it. If I can get my finger. Clear sides. It's like cellophane wrap in your kitchen, saran wrap, whatever. Cut it, go back a little bit. I can get underneath. And we'll do same thing to the other side. I can get it up. Oh, it's already ripped. No, it's not.
I want to pull up. I don't like to cut things unless I know exactly what I'm cutting. So I pull up, I can see my scissors through it, and I know I'm only cutting that clear piece. I don't want to cut any organs, so I'm just kind of sliding along. Here we go. Now I can peel this open. Nice. Okay. So when you think about movement, we covered the movement. It moves with using the mantle as a jet rocket with water. We talked about the arms, talked about the tentacles. We need to talk about breathing, how it uses respiration. And here it is. See this long strip here, this long strip here. See all those little fine lines? If you did the shark dissection with this, you've already seen that those are gills that go all the way along. And gills allow water to move across the gill it pulls oxygen out of the water and then pushes it into the blood. It's like us. We breathe air that has oxygen in it. We pull oxygen out of the air and then push the old air back out. They pull water in. When they suck the water into their mantle, they push it back out. It runs across the gills and they breathe. So you can see there's a path, a vessel. It's like a clear tube because most of the blood should be out of your squid. But that clear tube will carry that blood with oxygen up into the heart, and the squid has three hearts. A lot of love, a lot of love to give. Three hearts. Does that mean they have to buy three Valentine's Day cards every year for their significant other? I'm just running my finger along here, separating that clear plastic in. So if I follow the gills up, where the gills go, it's right into the heart, one of the hearts. Yeah, I got that. Here's one, it's like a sack. It's not as muscular as other hearts. There's part of another one. So here's one here. It looks like the blood really got drained out of this one. You can see a little bit of the blood left, but there's another thin sack. See how flimsy the two outside hearts are thin. They're like collecting hearts. Another one's hidden out here. And then the central heart right there to push the blood. I said these are the reproductive structures. Go back. There you can see an artery carrying blood. So that one has a little bit. And right in between the artery, it's called the notochord, which is basically the spinal cord. Right in that cartilage. And you can feel it's kind of firm, cartilage, and then the is right down the center of it. So they do have a brain and they have a nervous system. So they're a little bit more evolved than the other animals we've looked at. Okay. Pull this back. You've got a liver and intestine here. You kind of feel. Palpate means to feel. Ooh, there's something firm right there. Okay, I got to cut. You don't have to do this, but I'm curious. I want to see what's inside of there. Because when they eat, their mouth is back here. We looked at it a little while ago. We'll look at it again. Comes up and in. I'm just gonna see this section. Oops, pop. Eh, nope, it's all soupy. It just felt firm. As soon as I popped that, it was just feeling dense. So that's uh, going to be poo. Let's get that out of the way. I don't have any baby wipes or a diaper on me, so I can't cover that up. But that is the coelom or the intestines. So that is basically the digestive tract. And these little glands that sit here, hepatopancreatic glands, they're like your liver and your pancreas together to make digestive enzymes. Follow this down. If you want, you can cut the siphon. You can see right here's where the ink comes out. And the ink gland, not oh, doesn't have a ton of ink either, but you can see the gland. You can see where ink leaked through when it died. But when it's preserved, 
the ink gets solid, so it's not like we could take this out and put it in a pen and write with it, but you can. There's the whole gland. Okay, separate. A cool thing about most animals are their organs are all in sacs. Like we saw the sack here, we can pull it apart and follow. So I can kind of just take closed scissors and run underneath the ink sac, pick it up. And then my finger the rest of the way down or my scissors, closed scissors. Keep running it down, running it down. There we go. Shoop. We're experimenting. I wanna see how much of the sack I can get out. So that's their protective function. Squid are really good hunters. They're really smart, but other animals want to eat them too. Like shark, whales, dolphins, seals. Okay. See that sack. It should be more round and bulgy here with the tube coming down, but it's pretty much uniform all the way down. And then you can see where when they squirt the ink, it goes right into the siphon. And it's when they're pushing the water here, it's pushing over the ink and mixing the ink with the water. So it makes a big cloud of ink. It's like when you take a cup of water and you put a drop of food coloring in it, it slowly spreads out. But if you squirt the food coloring really fast, it spreads out into the water really fast. So they create this ink cloud and they can swim away at 25 miles an hour to get away from whatever's trying to eat them. Parts. And this is a cool one that you might want to go back and play with. Like, for instance, we looked at the mouth, but you could always open it up. <coughs> Excuse me. Whoa. Look in here. Find the radula, which is a beak. And it's just like a bird's beak, but it's only a one sided bird's beak. And there it is. It's nice and firm. If you play with it enough, you can pull it out because the muscles that hold it in place are weak after it dies. You can take it, grab a hold of it, wiggle, 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 and eventually pull it, like pulling a tooth. But that beak, it's hard to get things right up to the mouth. So the beak kind of like rips things apart. It's strong arms can rip a fish apart and then tuck little pieces down and then peel the rest of it with the beak. You can always explore probe and follow the GI track. I would use the more flat side. You can go in. I can feel the radula, how firm it is like a beak. Oh yeah. Kind of snapping. Snappy. Mm -hmm. Snappy snappy. We got time. Uh, what else we have what? Lamprey? And crab. Oh we're running out of time. Okay. Well you could do this. I would, maybe later, take your scissors, find the radula, cut, and you can follow the GI track and actually look at the mouth on the inside. And just keep cutting along. But time-wise, we covered the external anatomy, we covered the internal anatomy. When you take the pins out, put them back in the top, one, you have six, I only had five. Two, three, four, five. Hmm, that's so strange. Oh, there it is, there's the last one, six. <coughs> all right, but they're all accounted for, so I don't have to worry about poking myself. Crab. Mr. Crab. Ooh. All right. Crab is in the phylum Arthropoda, the arthropod. Oh no, my crab's missing some legs. Oh, nuts. A couple legs. Hmm. There's a leg missing here, leg missing there. End of the legs missing there. My goodness. If you have a female, 
there's this, sorry, if you have a male, there's a straight stripe right here down the middle. If you have a female, there's actually a horseshoe shape going across it. If you look at its back, those are barnacles. So that's another living creature that's hitching a ride. So as the crab goes along and walks through things, the barnacles will eat off of the environment the crab's going through. See them? Cool. Structures. Oh, my claw is even broken. Nuts. All right, well, I have one decent claw right here. See it? This one is missing. Some. This part's actually called the dactyl. The other side's the pincer. You can see. Dactyl means finger. So there's one side that's like a finger, and the other one's actually more like a um, like an anvil or a vice. I can't get it open. What do we have to find? Two pair of antennae. Having a bad day with crabs. Look my look my. Antenna and eyeballs are missing. No. Well, normally you would have four antennae sticking out right across here. You have two lateral ones, which means to the side that are longer, and you have two shorter ones, the medial ones that are shorter. And then you should have two eyes that come out of a spout. Spout. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, stalk. So two eyes that come up on a stalk. If you see a typical drawing of a crab, you'd see that. And this crab has had a really bad, bad day, missing legs and everything. Poor crab. All right. So these claws are not for walking. We don't consider those legs. The next six legs are called the walking legs. One, two, three, well, four, five, six. And the last two legs are typically referred to as the but the toad crab doesn't have the swimming. Here's what the swimming structure. It's kind of like a little fin. It can help move. Rock dweller, and that's why he looks like a rock. Let's see. Looks like a rock because he camouflages in with a rock. The barnacles can give a little armor to the back, but they also push to the back. The shell. Chitin, insects, um, crabs, cockroaches, they all have a shell that's made of stuff. And if you, um, in the science world, ground shells from these up, they put it and chitin sticks to fat. So, so they were giving a diet pill that was filled with chitin because you could eat fat, diet pill, and the fat would go straight through you without you getting calories from it. I don't know if they they do. You can see the cephalothorax. Open. You see some of the gills, internal gills. Get it closed. Whoop. When I cut this earlier, it was a piece of cake. So if we go to the back, the cut. Oops. Go in by a leg. I'll put a bell. This is your time. In by a leg and then snip. Go into the same hole you just snipped at. Snip again. Snip again. And you can go front or back, but I'm actually going to shoot for taking the back off. So this was kind of a fun trick earlier. When you crack the shell, it's going to do it again. Once you get the shell cracked, you can kind of pull it and open it. And the whole back of the shell comes right off. Sweet. Oh no, my organs are coming apart. I don't want that. I want to try and keep them all down. Stay down there. Stay down there. So you can see that wrapper. The wrapper goes all the way through the shell around, just like we saw in the squid. And that would normally protect these organs and keep them in place. But Well, nuts. I got some broken stuff here. So I'm just carefully trying to peel it so it stays as much in place as possible. Cool. So up here in the back of the shell, this is the hepatopancreas again. 
it makes digestive enzymes because it will eat up here through its mouth. You can see it has these two little uh, pinchers. They're not pinchers, they're pincers that help it grab and pull the food in. Food goes into the mouth, comes down here to the esophagus. It gets introduced to the enzymes, goes down into the stomach, which I destroyed. So you probably have a squishy little sack right here. You got some fan-like structures here, fan-like structures here, and then a squishy sack. That's the stomach. Right below it is a heart. Oh, you can't rip my heart out. So I accidentally tore the heart out. <laughs> but it's a little tiny heart. So the heart will push blood up over these gills. You can see the gills. Let's separate the gills. A little clear stuff off. And you can see all the lines on the gills, just like we saw with the gills and the squid. So water will flow up and in over the gills and then back out, up and in, over the gills, back out. And every time the crab moves its legs, it actually pumps the water over the gills. So the gills will flex a little bit, and move the water. Oop, that's the other part of the heart. Poor thing. Oop, you see these little things here? Maxillopods help with bringing the food in, smashing and digesting, processing. You can see each of the legs, they have eight legs. Two claws. They have the eight legs, they have the two swimming legs. That's all the anatomy you needed. You can play around with this, play with the barnacles, feel the shell, see if you can reassemble the anatomy and bring it back to life like Frankenstein crab. That's the crab. Crab's really good for your ecosystem because they also feed off the bottom. Crabs walk, walk along and they actually like dead animals. So they'll take a dead fish and just rip the dead fish apart, start eating it. Bottom feeders. That's crazy. Some of the things that we consider a delicacy, like a crab or a lobster, are actually the arthropods of the sea. The arthropods of a house are cockroaches. Gross. So when you eat a lobster, you're actually eating something in the same family as a cockroach. Nasty. What's also fun is that when lobsters were caught 100 years ago, um, they weren't considered a delicacy. They were an accident when you're catching fish for rich people. The lobsters were caught in the nets, and so they would give the lobster to the poor people and lobster and poor people are like, oh, okay, I'll eat it. And they ate it. And nowadays it's kind of flipped. We actually try to catch the lobster and they're really expensive. So, all right, crab. Oh, there's the horseshoe design. So if you have something like that, that's a horseshoe design, it's a female. And this whole body is called the cephalothorax because it's cephala means head, thorax means body or chest, all in one. The biggest crab out there is 12 feet wide from leg to leg. It's a Japanese spider crab. So just imagine this giant armored spider thing crawling up out of the water. Forget Godzilla, Japanese spider crabs, those are scary. All right, next fish, lamprey. It's a fish, it's not a snake. It looks like a snake. Its body designs a lot like a snake and it's kind of like we talked about before, that horror morph morphology. It's hard sometimes to separate what goes into what categories because if you look at everything about this, it looks like a snake. It doesn't have side fins or lateral fins, pectoral fins are what we call it on a fish. It doesn't have the characteristics we see with a fish like a jaw. It has a round circular mouth. Its gills look different. Everything about it looks different. It looks more like a leech actually, which would be uh, an insect. So if we look at this, it's a special type of fish. There are two classes of fish. One's called a bony fish, and they call it that because it has bones, it has a jaw, it has bones, just like we have. And then cartilaginous fish, which are jawed fish, like a shark, but they don't have a real skeleton, not a hard skeleton, they have a cartilage skeleton. So if you did the 
the shark lab, you already saw that. You can take their bones, quote unquote, and look right through them. They're translucent because they're not hard like human bone. So this is weird because it doesn't fit into either category. They call this a super species. It's older than the other fish, but it's not as evolved because the other fish evolved jaws to be predators, like really aggressive predators, like a shark. This one has a round mouth. They call it the buckle opening, like a belt buckle. How close I can get. Cover up some words and see if I can get the focus back. There we go. There it is. So normally its mouth is pretty round, not so square like this looks. You can see the teeth in there. You can actually see right along the edge. There's some soft stringy like things. They're called the papilla. Some people call them tentacles because they can move. You look at them really close, they move like tentacles on an octopus. But it's this layer here. See them kind of move. Those are feelers. They're very sensitive. So they know when they touch another fish. It's like our fingertips. This would be their fingertip going all the way around. Just below that, you have three rows or layers of teeth. You have kind of an external tooth, an internal tooth, and then there's a fanged tooth way down here. But when, whoops, when they grab a hold of you, first thing they do is they feel you. So they feel your skin, they know they've got a hold of you. Then they take these teeth and they go, and they squeeze them in, just like this. So the teeth are out and they hook. So they come in and they hook into your skin, like the leech. And now they've got a grip. That's what the teeth are for. And then the scariest part is this part right in the middle. Oh, the light's not getting down there. You might be able to see yours though. It's the tongue. So if you go all the way down, see it there? There it is. There's the tongue. And the tongue actually has three hooked teeth on it. The central one and there are two side ones. That's what gets you. So when the tongue comes out, whoop, it kind of licks you, but it also sticks you with those sharp hooks and starts sucking the blood out of you like a vampire. And then right in the middle of the tongue, you can see a tube. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Give me some focus. I get focus and I lose my light. But you might be able to see it better with yours. Right in the middle of the tongue, there's a tube, so that's where the blood goes in. So they don't have, they don't eat solid things. They're eating blood. Pretty easy to process, and they just suck the nutrients out. So they're actually a parasite. Um, I don't know how long ago it was, but someone brought, these are an ocean creature, and someone brought these into Lake Michigan, and they started attacking all the trout and a bunch of other species, and they actually eliminated a couple of species in Lake Michigan because they just destroyed it. So some of the benefits are they destroy bad fish out in the ocean. Um, one of the disadvantages is that they suck the blood and life out of the other ones, so not like a vampire. So that is the buccal region. That's the mouth. There's the tongue in the middle. If we flip it to the side, you see there's an eye. There's an eye. It's clouded over. So you can see where they're at. If you look in between, you'll find nostrils. A little hole right there, nostril. And it's not like your nose where they breathe air through it because they don't breathe air. What happens is water will go in here. And if there's, say there's a shark in the area, when a shark urinates in the water, they can smell that urine through here. So the urine goes in the water into this little nasal area, hits little nasal receptors, and then pushes the water back out. It doesn't go down to their airways. It's, it's closed ended, just like a shark has. So the air goes in. They know where the shark's at based on smell and they start swimming that way. Or if there's a little blood in the water or whatever, because that smell. Right behind it, there's a light area. Can you see it? It's actually kind of like a clear window because right underneath it is an organ called the pineal organ. So I can't get the focus to work right. So this little pineal window actually allows light to go in it. And it's almost like a third eye. So when light goes in, it tells the lamprey when it's daytime, when it's nighttime. You have a pineal gland just like this, or pineal organ in your brain. When light gets in your eyes, your eyes sends a signal to the pineal gland saying, hey, it's daytime, don't go to sleep. But when it starts getting dark, your eyes sense darkness, it sends a signal to the pineal gland and make a chemical called melatonin that makes you sleepy. In fact, you can buy melatonin in a jar and it helps you sleep at night. 
but the lamprey can tell. It's called a biological clock. You can tell when it's day or night or what time of day it is. So eye, nostril, pineal gland, eye, buckle. Next. Can you see these little holes along the side? So it looks like this is the furthest one back. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven of them. Flip it over. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those. Those are gill slits. The external gill slits. That's where water goes in. Goes into the gills, the internal gills, pulls the oxygen out of the water, and then pushes it back out. So lampreys, they swim all the time and get water going over there. They actually have muscular groups that they can flex so they don't have to swim. Because what if the fish they're attached to stops swimming? Then it's stopping there, it would die. So it can actually squeeze and push water over that to keep alive. The last thing is kind of hard to see on a lamprey. It's easier to see on a shark. All right. There's a lateral line. It's really hard to see. You can kind of see hints of it there. It's a light gray in color, but it comes all the way along the side. And the lateral line is an extra organ that we don't have. The lateral line lets a lamprey know if there's a fish by it, the fish pushes water and pressure activates the lateral line, tells the lamprey, hey, there's something over here and how far away it is. So like a shark, it could actually circle its prey, looking for whatever warm-blooded animal it's looking for. So it can smell it. It can feel how far away it is. It can nibble on it. It can feel with its, its uh, pillae to make sure it's soft tissue and they can bite right in. Wow, you can still see some of that blood. It's gruesome. Perfect for Halloween. You see that round. There's no jaw. Not like us where there's a hinge and the top of our mouth and bottom of our mouth close. That, there is no hinge. So it's a jawless fish. All right, other structures out here. Here you have a fin on its back. Do you remember what that was called? It's on its back, so what was the D word? Dorsal. So here's a dorsal fin. Here's another dorsal fin. Here we call the anterior dorsal, and this is the posterior caudal dorsal. And then this fin all the way to the very back is the caudal fin. So when it swims, it swims like a snake. It doesn't swim like a regular fish. If it didn't have this fin, it would spin all the time. I'd probably get dizzy. Let's cut into it and see what's inside. Okay. First thing we were going to do, there are a couple ways you can do it, and you can always experiment with this later. We can cut it across like this and look at the organs inside, and back here, back here. But this is me a little bit funner. We're going to cut the head. So we're going to look for that tongue. I'm going to hold it. So I'm looking at the dorsal side. This is the back. Here's the front. And I'm going to take the scissors and I'm going to cut. So I separate its left side from its right side. Oh, we forgot to talk about symmetry. Obviously, this is bilateral symmetry since it has a left and right. And I'm cutting with the very back of the scissors. The tip's not that sharp. I'm kind of just cutting a little bit, cutting a little bit, cutting a little bit. Now I can open up the mouth. Now I can really see the tongue. See it? Right there, with the tube down in the middle. I think I cut the fangs. Oh well. But that tongue will come out, poke, stab, and start sucking the blood. I'm going to keep going. And you can keep going too. So it's again, cut, wiggle, cut, wiggle, cut, wiggle. It's kind of cutting along. It doesn't have a very big brain, but we just cut through the brain, most likely. See? between the eyes, probably destroy, oh, there it is. See that little ball right there? That's part of the brain. The other part should be over on this side. It's not very big, but right between the eyes. There's an eye, there's the brain, there's another eye. 
means just off the brain, you're gonna have a spinal cord. They actually call it a notochord. I'm gonna cut a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Cool. Kind of messy in there, but I can feel here is some bony like structure. So the spinal cord's right in the center of that. And it's really small, so I probably just destroyed it. Oh, looks like there's a little bit because it goes over the brain. Brain, little wire going to the spinal cord. You can see it. Let's cut down. So now we don't have to cut the whole thing in half. Let's cut right here. I'm sliding my scissors just inside like this, kind of wiggle, snip, wiggle, snip, push a little bit further back, wiggle, snip, wiggle, snip, wiggle, snip. I'm not cutting the whole thing in half anymore. I'm actually just cutting its belly. Ugh, bile, that yellowy stuff. So we hit the pancreatic gland that makes bile and other enzymes to digest food. Still going right down the belly, right down the belly. Whoops, can't slip the bar. Straight down the belly, straight down the belly. Now I'm going slow towards the end because right there. I don't know if you can zoom on that right by my thumb, there are two little tiny holes. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, right there. There's a hole right there and a hole right behind it. I don't know if you can see them, they're tiny. The front one is the anus or where it poos from and the one behind it is called the cloaca. And most fish, it's one hole with the two combined. It's just like a chicken. So it can release its eggs from here, it can pee from here, it can poo from here. It does everything from that one spot, just like a chicken poops and lays an egg. Oop, I squirted a little bit. Now you can probably see the hole because it just squirted out of it. But I squished the intestines in it on an accident and it squished some stuff out. So you can do it again. Yeah, you can kind of see the fluid coming out. All right, so now I've opened the entire lamprey. Let's pin it. Take a pen, just like we did before. You got to pull it, push it at an angle towards the lamprey. Take another one, pull back, pin it towards the lamprey, and it holds this open. And every time I look at this lamprey, I do not feel bad about cutting it open. Just it's so scary. I feel like I just did a, a really good thing for the world. Okay, the so first thing you want to look at here was the head. Remember. You have the seven slits on the outside. I don't know if you can count them, but you should also have seven in here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. There's the seventh one. Those are the internal gills. Water comes in from the outside, goes over the gills, and then shoots back out. We have them on the other side too. So pull this open. I'm feeling around, there it is. So right behind the gills, I'm feeling there's a hard structure. This is a squishy tube. This is a hard structure. You feel it right here? That's a muscle. So here's where I pick up oxygen, comes through here and the heart pumps it. And that hard structure is the heart. There's the liver. Uh -oh, this heart's kind of wedged in there. You can see the liver slides off. Heart's still right up above it. I have a heart, man. Now I have two. <laughs> there it is. Oh, still not underneath it. So you can take your scissors. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Oops, I splattered me. Gross. Snip, snip. Close this side a little bit. Snip, snip. Oops. 
And hmm, really hanging on. Must have been a runner. I have really bad jokes. Okay, there it goes. Woo. So there's the heart. You can see the vessels coming in, well, where they were coming into the top. You see them coming out of the back. Little holes. Boom, 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 boom. Heart. Liver. Intestine. Yep, spiral intestine. Our blood vessels. Two blood vessels. Did I cut them? Did I cut them? Oh, there you can see the line of one, two, actually together. All the way down. It's the gonads. Reproduction. And you can see all of these passageways go all the way down to the cloaca, all the way at the very end. Whoop. You want, you can actually cut across and look at, so if you pull this back, just like we did with the uh, squid, you feel it's kind of cartilage-y like, you can see the cartilage skeleton, or how well you can see those lines going like a rib cage. You can see the blood vessels, if you get past those, then you're at the spinal cord. So if you wanted to cut across, good. I say if you wanted to and I do it, I'm like, yeah, I gotta do it. I gotta do it. So I'm cutting across. Because I'm a neuro guy, I love this. There we are. One pen. One, two, three. No, four, five, one more out here, six. All my pins are accounted for. But now I can see. There it is. So there was that blood vessel, a hollow tube. There's another blood vessel hollow tube right there. Right here's where the spinal cord goes. So you can see the tubes as they line up. You can see the muscle on the body. Remember, this thing wiggles like a snake, so its whole side of its body has to be muscle to wiggle back and forth. <coughs> Excuse me. What's that time? Okay. You can explore all you want. You can find different things. You can Google anatomy of starfish, squid, crabs, sponge, lamprey, whatever, and you can keep exploring. But I'm going to show you how to clean up so that when you're ready to clean up, it's easy, easy. Everything you need to put in one spot. So lamprey in the middle. Actually, I will pull this back so you can see. <coughs> Maybe. Can you just put that screen down so that Nice camera shows mm -hmm. the table. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. There we go. Cool. So I just put everything on it. I make sure my pins are all in the top going in because I don't want to get stabbed. Tweezers, ruler, scissors, crab. I'm going to put this sideways, the probe. I'm actually going to put the squid over it. Starfish. I don't know where the extra glove came from, but there it is. All my parts are in there. <coughs> this side was the side we started with, the bottom of the bag. So I want to go to that side. I'm going to take off this glove that's on the side of the open bag, the top of the bag. Because I can wrinkle it, open it, and now it's like a big glove. I can put my hand in it. I'm rolling it over. 
and I'm actually grabbing all my animals right through the bag. Still rolling it. My dirty hands always on this side, my clean hands always on that side. And it looks like all of this is clean all the way around. I take my other glove off. Oop. All in there. Squeeze the air out. This is why I make sure my pins were safe so they don't poke me. Bag. <laughs> Tie this up, or you can take the original rubber band, and I just spun it, bent it, so I've got a little nub here, and then stick the rubber band over it. Over, over again, boom. That's the whole thing. Clean enough to eat off of. Ooh, done. That's how easy that was. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for doing the sea creature lab. Hopefully you get a chance to do the shark lab or the uh, organs lab. We're probably going to do one with owl pellets where you'll dissect a scorpion and an insect and a mouse. And then you'll dissect an owl pellet to see what animals the owl ate by putting their skeleton back together. You might do a local animal one with turtles and fish and I can't remember the other local animals that were in that. But definitely make sure you keep watching. Join us again. Thanks for playing. Have a good weekend and we'll talk to you all soon.